Chapter 4 of Two Tactics of Social Democracy by Lenin. Read for LibriVox.org by Christian Picot at CommunistRevolution.org. Chapter 4 The Abolition of the Monarchist System and the Republic. Let us pass on to the next section of the resolution. In either case, such a victory will inaugurate a new phase in the revolutionary epoch. The task which the objective conditions of social development spontaneously raise in this new phase is the final abolition of the whole regime of social estates and of the monarchy in the process of mutual struggle among the elements of politically emancipated bourgeois society for the satisfaction of their social interests and for the direct acquisition of power. Therefore, the provisional government that would undertake to carry out the tasks of this revolution, which by its historical nature is a bourgeois revolution, would also, in regulating the mutual struggle of the antagonistic classes within the nation in the process of emancipation, not only have to push revolutionary development further forward, but also fight against those of its factors which threaten the foundation of the capitalist system. Let us examine this section which forms an independent part of the resolution. The idea underlying the above quoted arguments coincides with that stated in the third clause of the Congress resolution. But in comparing these parts of the two resolutions, the following radical difference at once becomes apparent. The Congress resolution, describing in a few words the social and economic basis of the revolution, concentrates attention entirely on the sharply defined struggle of classes for definite gains, and places the militant tasks of the proletariat in the forefront. The resolution of the conference, in a long, nebulous, and confused description of the social and economic basis of the revolution, speaks very vaguely about a struggle for definite gains and leaves the militant tasks of the proletariat altogether in the shade. The resolution of the conference speaks of the abolition of the old order in the process of mutual struggle among the various elements of society. The Congress resolution says that we, the party of the proletariat, must effect this abolition that only the establishment of a democratic republic signifies the real abolition of the old order, that we must win such a republic, that we shall fight for it and for complete liberty, not only against the autocracy, but also against the bourgeoisie, when it attempts, for it will surely attempt, to wrest our gains from us. The Congress resolution calls on a definite class to wage a struggle for a precisely defined immediate aim. The resolution of the conference discourses on the mutual struggle of various forces. One resolution expresses the psychology of active struggle, the other expresses that of the passive onlooker. One resounds with the call for live action the other is steeped in lifeless pedantry. Both resolutions state that the present revolution is only our first step, which will be followed by a second. But from this, one resolution draws the conclusion that we must all the more quickly make this first step, all the more quickly get it over, win a republic, mercilessly crush the counter-revolution, and prepare the ground for the second step. The other resolution, however, oozes, so to speak, with verbose descriptions of the first step, and, excuse the vulgar expression, choose the cud over it. 
The resolution of the Congress takes the old and eternally new ideas of Marxism about the bourgeois nature of a democratic revolution as a preface or first premise from which it draws conclusions as to the progressive tasks of the advanced class, which is fighting both for the democratic and for the socialist revolution. The resolution of the conference does not go beyond the preface, chewing it over and over again and trying to be clever about it. This is the very distinction which has long divided the Russian Marxists into two wings, the moralizing and the militant wings of the old days of legal Marxism, and the economic and political wings of the period of the nascent mass movement. From the correct premise of Marxism concerning the deep economic roots of the class struggle in general and of the political struggle in particular, the economists drew the singular conclusion that we must turn our backs on the political struggle and retard its development, narrow its scope, and reduce its aims. The political wing, on the contrary, drew a different conclusion from these same premises, namely, that the deeper the roots of our struggle at the present time, the more widely, the more boldly, the more resolutely and with greater initiative must we wage this struggle. We have the very same controversy before us now, only under different circumstances and in a different form. From the premises that a democratic revolution is far from being a socialist one, that the propertyless are not by any means the only ones to be interested in it, that it is deeply rooted in the inexorable needs and requirements of the whole of bourgeois society, from these premises we draw the conclusion that the advanced class must formulate its democratic aims all the more boldly, express them all the more sharply and completely, put forward the direct slogan of a republic, popularize the idea that a provisional revolutionary government is needed and that it is necessary ruthlessly to crush the counter-revolution. Our opponents, the new Iskraists, however, deduce from these very same premises that the democratic conclusions should not be expressed fully, that the slogan of a republic may be omitted from the practical slogans, that we can refrain from popularizing the idea that a provisional revolutionary government is needed, that a mere decision to convene a constituent assembly can be termed a decisive victory, that we need not advance the task of combating counter-revolution as our active aim, but that we may submerge it in a nebulous and, as we shall presently see, wrongly formulated reference to a process of mutual struggle. This is not the language of political leaders, but of archive mummies. And the more closely one examines the various formulae of the new Iskraist resolution, the clearer its aforementioned basic features become. We are told, for instance, of a process of mutual struggle among the elements of politically emancipated bourgeois society. Bearing in mind the subject with which this resolution deals, a provisional revolutionary government, one asks in astonishment, if you are referring to the process of mutual struggle, how can you keep silent about the elements which are politically enslaving bourgeois society? Do the conferencers really imagine that because they have assumed that the revolution will be victorious, these elements have already disappeared? Such an idea would be absurd in general, and would be an expression of the greatest political naivete and political short-sightedness in particular. After the victory of the revolution over the counter-revolution, the latter will not disappear. 
On the contrary, it will inevitably start a new and even more desperate struggle. Since the purpose of our resolution is to analyze the tasks that will confront us when the revolution is victorious, it is our duty to devote enormous attention to the tasks of repelling counter-revolutionary attacks, as is done in the resolution of the Congress, and not submerge these immediate, urgent, and vital political tasks of a militant party in general discussions on what will happen after the present revolutionary period. What will happen when a politically emancipated society will already be in existence. Just as the economists, by repeating the general truism that politics are subordinated to economics, covered up their failure to understand current political tasks, so the new Iskrists, by repeating the general truism that struggles will take place in a politically emancipated society, cover up their failure to understand the urgent revolutionary tasks of the political emancipation of this society. Take the expression, the final abolition of the whole regime of socialist states and the monarchy. In plain language, the final abolition of the monarchist system means the establishment of a democratic republic. But our good Martinov and his admirers think that this expression is far too simple and clear. They insist on rendering it more profound and saying it more cleverly. As a result, we get, on the one hand, ridiculous and vain efforts to appear profound. On the other, we get a description instead of a slogan, a sort of melancholy looking backward instead of a stirring appeal to march forward. We get the impression not of living people eager to fight for a republic here and now, but of fossilized mummies who, sub specie eternitatis, consider the question from the standpoint of plus quam perfectum. Let us proceed further. The provisional government would undertake to carry out the tasks of this bourgeois revolution. Here we see at once the result of the fact that our conferencers have overlooked a concrete question which confronts the political leaders of the proletariat. The concrete question of a provisional revolutionary government was obscured from their field of vision by the question of the future series of governments which will carry out the aims of the bourgeois revolution in general. If you want to consider the question historically, the example of any European country will show you that it was a series of governments, not by any means provisional, that carried out the historical aims of the bourgeois revolution, that even the governments which defeated the revolution were nonetheless forced to carry out the historical aims of that defeated revolution. But what is called a provisional revolutionary government is something altogether different from what you are referring to. That is the name given to the government of a revolutionary epoch that directly replaces the overthrown government and rests on the insurrection of the people, and not on some kind of representative institutions coming from the people. A provisional revolutionary government is the organ of struggle for the immediate victory of the revolution. For immediately repelling counter-revolutionary attempts, and not by any means an organ for carrying out the historical aims of the bourgeois revolution in general. Gentlemen, let us leave it to the future historians of a future Ruskaya Starina to determine exactly what aims of the bourgeois revolution we, or this or that government, shall have achieved. There will be time enough to do that thirty years from now. At present, we must put forward slogans and give practical directives for the struggle for a republic and for the proletariat's most active participation in this struggle. For the reasons stated, the last propositions in the section of the resolution which we have quoted above are also unsatisfactory. 
the expression that the provisional government would have to regulate the mutual struggle among the antagonistic classes is exceedingly inapt, or at any rate awkwardly put. Marxists should not use such liberal Osvobenia formulations, which lead one to believe that it is possible to have governments which serve not as organs of the class struggle, but as its regulators. The government would not only have to push revolutionary development further forward, but also fight against those of its factors which threaten the foundations of the capitalist system. But it is the proletariat, the very same in whose name the resolution is speaking, that constitutes this factor. Instead of indicating just how the proletariat should push revolutionary development further forward at the present time, push it further than the constitutionalist bourgeois would care to go, instead of advice to prepare definite ways and means of combating the bourgeoisie when the latter turns against the conquests of the revolution, we are offered a general description of a process which does not say a word about the concrete aims of our activity. The new Iskraist method of expressing its views reminds one of Marx's opinion in his famous theses on Feuerbach of the old materialism, which was alien to the ideas of dialectics. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, said Marx. The point, however, is to change it. Similarly, the new Iskraists can give a tolerable description and explanation of the process of struggle which is taking place before their eyes, but they are altogether incapable of giving a correct slogan for this struggle. Good marchers, but bad leaders. They belittle the materialist conception of history by ignoring the active, leading, and guiding part in history which can and must be played by parties that understand the material prerequisites of a revolution and that have placed themselves at the head of the progressive classes. End of chapter 4 This recording is in the public domain.